Hi, welcome to Arts Alive. This is Yamhill County's art program where we meet creators, artists, musicians, writers, and people who are making great things. I'm Emily Grosvenor. My guest today is Caitlin Stewart of Deer House Collective. Deer House Collective is a boutique floral studio operating here in McMinnville. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. So we're coming up on Valentine's Day and I thought it would be really fun to check in with you and um, you actually brought in uh, a beautiful arrangement for us today to, to look at just so we could get a sense of the thought and the vision mm -hmm. that goes behind great floral designs. So th there seems to be something amazing happening in the floral arts these days. I was wondering if you could speak briefly about what you see happening. I think a lot of people are responding um, to more of an artistic aspect to floral design. They're bringing in just what I'm calling romantic tones and these like wild, lush, kind of like English garden inspired um, florals. And that's what I'm inspired by, especially living in the Northwest. Um, there's just so much lush abundance here. Um, I'm often like driving somewhere and pulling over on the side of the road and like gathering things and pulling in those um, pieces um, for my floral designs and I'm just really inspired by what's around me. Um, so I'm, I am enjoying what the floral industry is doing by just kind of saying no to primary tones and working more like just with a full palette which I'm really responding to. I pull a lot of antique floor like colors together that I'm inspired by um, from paintings and other creative aspects that I'm seeing. Can you talk a little bit about how how that emerged? This uh, this specific voice that you have um, in in design, kind of how did that get started? How did it progress? Um, I had been apprenticing under another florist who had like a really interesting view and the whole floral industry I feel like was just uh, more traditional at the time mm -hmm. and there was a lot of creatives who were pushing into the scene and realizing well, I can take some flowers and put it together I can deconstruct this bouquet and make it more interesting um, and so when I moved to McMinnville, there wasn't a lot of like f resources to find florals. So I just started like going to the grocery store and seeing what I could put together. And so piecing those together with um, different things from my garden um, was kind of how I started this approach was basically like, what do I have around me? Okay, this in my garden, let's use this. Um, and it's kind of evolved into an over-the-top kind of feel, which I'm all about, just maximalism and like mm -hmm. too much texture, I don't think is a bad thing. I love that. I love the idea that you are drawing from this place and creating something beautiful that has that connection. Um, so what are some of the items that you would pull from your, from your yard or from, from the area? Well, it depends on the season. I am really looking forward to spring. Mm -hmm. I saw some blossoms the other day from like cherry trees, um, apple trees, of course, you know, in the autumn. So it really depends. I, I'm inspired by odd things. Um, <laughs> my kids usually think that's strange. I'll be on a walk with them. I'm like, this is a perfect stick that would work in this arrangement. and. It kind of pulls together um, in a weird dramatic way, this like little moment that I usually call in the bouquet, like, ooh, this is the perfect little spot for this, um, this stick or this tulip, this whatever Oregon is bringing. Mm. Um, I think I'm, like most people, I think we're looking forward to like lush florals of spring, like peonies or just garden roses. My yard has so many garden roses, mm -hmm. and I'm really thankful for whoever planted those. Um, let's see. There's just, yeah, there's so many varieties to work with here. And there's a local farm that grows eucalyptus, which I wasn't even aware of that oh, could wow. grow. Yeah, 
So uh, Jay Bacon Farms is oh, nice. growing eucalyptus, and I'm just happy to support as locally and sustainably as possible. Um, that's definitely a process that I'm seeking. So is that is that part of, uh, so there's the artistic part of it, and then there's also the sustainability question, yes. right? I know that within the floral industry, books have been written about how crazy it is that we, that we buy these roses that are, are grown in, in Colombia and then we you know ship them thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of, of miles. Um, so are you pushing back against that a little bit? I definitely am and it has to do with the seasonality of things. Mm -hmm. So right now we are in winter and the arrangement that I brought today is sourced from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. a lot of this is flown from other areas and typically if I am creating for a client, I'm trying to source as locally as possible. And I'm also trying to find um, avenues for the florals to go after the event. So I'm interested in sustainability from the beginning to the end. So say you host a dinner party, mm -hmm. I would love to talk with you about, could we find a home, like a shelter or maybe um, an elderly home where someone would really respond to these flowers for the week ahead. Since you enjoyed them for one day, could we find a home for them in the future? Oh, wow. And mm -hmm. my clients are really responding to that. Uh, and I, I just love to bring the flowers to some people who maybe don't have that in their budget. Um, and so I also, if I can't find a use for the flowers, I will dry a lot of them and I will use them again for like dried floral installations, which I just worked with a photographer, Brittany Rossman, and she hired me for a giant, floor, like, dried installation in her studio. So it's just behind um, kind of a backdrop for her clients. They just have a good time interacting with that, and I really try to educate who I'm working with of let's consider the cost, you know, not just financially, but like what we're doing to our planet. Can we use this as long as possible? Um, and that became a passion of mine once I started mm. stepping into the wedding industry and seeing all the careless waste, just like entire weddings thrown away um, One because there day. wasn't a plan. And so that's really bothering me. And I think that's probably going to become a part of my future, like figuring out the sustainable aspect of what to do at the end of events. Um, I don't know what that looks like yet. <laughs> But it's I'm really interesting. It. It, it kind of honors the flower as an as an object, as a living thing, mm -hmm. from its beginnings to yeah. to the end. That's really really fascinating. Well, let's talk for a moment about just the creation of this this gorgeous piece. Where where do you begin? You talked a little bit about how you have a maximalist style, <laughs> um, which which I also really really respond to. It feels. It feels very painterly to me. Thank you. Um, the way the way you work. Where where do you begin, and how does it kind of come into being? So for this arrangement today, I wanted to consider two things. I considered the space mm -hmm. that I'm creating in. I knew it was going to be a big studio space, so I could create kind of a full scale, large editorial arrangement, and I wanted to consider educating the viewers about cost. And so I mm -hmm. only, I purposefully went to a grocery store with $25 and just purchased what I could. And then I took the items apart. I looked at my vessel and I just decided you know, what shape, what flow do I want to do? So I tried to create kind of just this cascading mm -hmm. flow and I build the beginnings with green and then I kind of like it's my structure and then I will start to consider how nature is growing which is always at different levels mm. and so I will place things lower and higher and then I always want moments flowing out towards you um, just I stare at it and I make sure that my eye is kind of gravitating all around um, if I'm getting stuck on a particular space, how can I create movement somewhere else to intri like, intrigue it otherwise? Um, and I 
you can find a lot of reference, like you were saying, with like masters, paintings. Right. Um, what were people sourcing for still lifes? They would probably source something lovely that would be timeless. And so I get a lot of inspiration, of course, from paintings. <laughs> so I'm glad you picked up on that quality. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think that's where the like pouring out and the maximalism comes in, because it, it truly is. It's it's beauty and it's nature and it's only going to exist in this form for you know a week or two and then it's going to start changing beauty i really respond to it in the dried state i think that flowers are still pretty when they're drying it's it's just a different concept a different process so a different take <laughs> so do you beauty. do you encourage people to kind of let the arrangement sit and self-dry or I how do you educate them about kind of how to live with it? I think that you can keep this looking like this for two weeks by replacing water mm -hmm. yeah, but after that after that mark like these florals will they will all dry really well so you can just naturally stop taking care of it and see what happens and sometimes it's an experiment that doesn't work out well and sometimes it dries really beautifully and you can keep it you know just like on your bookshelf or somewhere pretty and get the dust off it occasionally. <laughs> I've had one sit, a sit around for quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> so what about color? I mean these colors are so interesting as well. You've got that I mean that kind of peachy rosy carnation. Um, in some ways you think of carnation as, as like a Kind of like an old school mm -hmm. floral, but to see it presented here, it feels very modern. Mm, I think carnations had like a resurgence last year. Oh, did they? They mm -hmm. were so amazing, and whoever was in charge of the carnations <laughs> was breeding these really romantic and antique tones. Mm. So these are are like a champagne, almost like a dried, you know, beautiful. I don't know, just the tone is it very different than what I'd, um, what I've thought of a carnation to be in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that they've definitely got a bad rap for just being an example or I don't, yeah, an example of something that is inexpensive. Right. But I wanted to show a way to really kind of give them their, I don't know, their own stage to speak because their texture is really lovely. Um, but. I really respond to these kind of soft, muted tones, mm. and I really love to work in high contrast. Um, so, talking about like these purple tulips, just working in that kind of um, dramatic moment is important to me. And these are the tulips are going to continue to change form throughout their time in the arrangement because they have minds on their own of their own, and they follow the sunlight. Um, but yeah, when I'm creating, I'm typically pulling muted tones. Um, I really respond to that for some reason. <laughs> so it's, it, it sounds like you have to think about that too. Like what's going to be opening? What's going mm -hmm. to be, uh, is it going to open? Yes. How, will, how will, it, will it affect the overall design when it opens? Yes. And that's a lot of trial and error. Uh, one of the first wedding bouquets I made had a lot of tight tulips in it. It was a hand-tied bouquet. And I set it to rest overnight in the morning. All the tulips had like grown and I just <laughs> was shocked <laughs> and terrified because it looked terrible. And so I had to take it apart. And, but I now just kind of listen to like the what the floral wants to do, like what shape, and I hold them more gently in my hand when mm. I'm creating with my hands, and um, encouraging um, like other people that I work with to never force flowers. Um, just, I mean, you can be firm with them and, and try to get them to go where, but they have a natural shape and they're going to flow. Um, so just allow that Sounds organically. Like parenting, honestly. <laughs> it really does. You might have an idea of what you want as your outcome right but the florals and the greens are going to give you a much better representation of how they should look mm. so yeah and it's a 
it's meditative work. Like once yeah. you get into that flow, like in most creative outlets, it's just, it's so nice to step into, just kind of be at peace, not really thinking, just kind mm. of following. Once you have that general structure and the shape set up. So we don't have smell vision uh, <laughs> however, I will say that there's this amazing aroma wafting from, from, from these flowers. Um, the only time I've ever really done like a large scale arrangement like this in a, in a setting, um, I did a workshop up in Portland once. I, I don't know if I've ever felt that in the moment before. Okay. Um, as I when like I was that. smelling those flowers. I mean, what's it like to work with them just as a, as a material? Well, just to drive from the flower market with a car full of flowers mm. is really lovely, and I consider myself lucky mm. to have the aromatics as to work that I work with. And um, when I process all the florals in my studio, aka garage, <laughs> I'm completely full. It's just stunning and beautiful, and I don't know. It's it's certainly something that I love to be able to work with. So tell me a little bit about, we well, can't see all of the vessel, but what, do, what would you say about choosing a vessel? How important is that? I can hold it up. <laughs> it's really interesting. So this is just a little vase. Um, you can, it's like maybe like eight inches wide, mm -hmm. and it's just a nice little compote vase. Um, you just really want to consider the space you're creating in and I mean I knew I had such a large scale to work with today so you could really find just a small little cup like a mason jar or whatever is in your cupboard and create within um, and just follow the shape of the florals and just fill it up and you you can add as you find more things as you walk about the town. Um, I would encourage not to forage from people's front yards because <laughs> those are their love, the beloved flowers that they're cultivating. My um, son's actually uh, went mushroom hunting okay. yesterday and brought back crocuses. Oh no. From someone's yard. I was like, oh my gosh, no, you did not do that. That's a good yeah. way to learn. But now they know what a crocus is. Yes. Right? Well, they are everywhere right now. Right. So maybe it was in like an alleyway. Let's I know. It's February 4th and yeah. the flowers are up. Oh my gosh. I am excited. <sighs> um, but yeah, alleyways are fair game, I think. Mm. And um, once you start playing with florals, it's, it's a great way to start gardening and encourage yourself like, how do these grow? I really need more of them. How do I keep the cost down? Well, I'll become a floral farmer. Well, it, we're, we live in a ridiculous area for, yeah. for florals. I mean, the Dahlia Farms, mm -hmm. the Edelman's, yeah. Peonies, the, the Iris, tulips. Shriners, Tulips. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we just have access to, to so much. We're so lucky here um, because within the 30 minutes drive, you're, yeah, you're at the Iris Gardens and those are stunning and people right. travel from all over the country and the world right. to just be in those gardens or buy bulbs to bring those gardens to their region. Exactly. Um, I certainly feel lucky being placed here. So what's, what's kind of the strangest thing you've ever sourced? Do you have like a strange sourcing story? Mm, I think a lot of it involves like country roads, driving along and just pulling on the side of the road mm -hmm. um, and figuring out what has thorns and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. There's always that surprise. I think that I foraged once and grabbed some thorns and started screaming and, got hurt. <laughs> and then someone was worried and came out to check on me. But um, luckily they were just concerned and not yelling at me for stealing their roadway. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It is kind of an odd thing, right? It really R is. Roses being being associated with love and being so so sticky. That's true. Um, so, what do you think makes a romantic arrangement? Um, I mean, for this one in particular, I was kind of playing around with a Valentine's Day palette, mm. very pink. Why do we think pink and red and everything is romantic? I. 
I would just look at the arrangement. It's very whimsical and, I don't know, playful. Mm -hmm. I think that, I don't know, there's not a lot of times in the year when we can have so much pink and like get away with it. Right. I was kind of giggling about this palette, like, oh, this is really interesting. I tend to have more of like a masculine aesthetic, so mm -hmm. I just went full pink today, which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm not really sure why or I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've been really happy to see the transformation that pink has gone through over the past couple of years. So in my, in my work at Oregon Home, I've, I'm getting all of these lifestyle books and, and products and they are, and seeing interiors and, mm -hmm. and bedrooms, pink bedrooms, and, and it's not, it's not just geared towards women. It's, yeah, it's becoming, true. I think it's moving to more gender neutral. It's becoming a neutral. Right. Right, kind of it's so interesting. Along the taupe lines, maybe. Right, I also really enjoy men in a pink shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every man should own a pink shirt. Because <laughs> it's such a likable color. I mean, I think they've done studies about pink being just one of those colors that makes you approachable and likable. Mm -hmm. Maybe because it mimics uh, like a Caucasian skin tone. I don't know. I think that it's joyful, like we were talking about. Yeah. It's, it's playful. Um, and it's not really in nature too naturally, or too often do you see pink. It's mostly like green and lush here. Springtime. So mm -hmm. yeah, it is like, oh my goodness, it's spring, everything's full, how exciting. So maybe it has that hopeful aspect behind it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so when you describe your, your florals, you sometimes call them polite and wild. Mm -hmm. I'm always interested in those two <laughs> words that kind of like have a rub. Yeah. Polite and wild, kind of how they fit together and like what exactly that meaning becomes. So what, what do you understand by, by polite and wild? I think what I mean by polite and wild would be just cultivating nature and following its organic flow in like a polite way. I'm not being in, invasive or in your face. I want to create something that can kind of convey the sense of romance to the audience or the client, but also I do like things to be kind of wild and huge and editorial. So how do we get those two things together. I'm just finding and playing with tones and palettes and texture and having a lot of fun. <laughs> it seems like you're really happy Yeah. B backstage. I am. This is uh, really strange to be on camera. <laughs> I'm usually like styling behind and directing things and like thinking grand scale and setting things. So to be talking and conveying my, um, my reason yeah. and process for things is something I'm really challenging myself to do this year. Right. My word is allow, and like allow. allowing things to happen. And that involves saying yes and no to things mm -hmm. and just figuring out more your boundary so that you can say yes to these things that may make you nervous all day. <laughs> Um, but I don't know. I think I'm getting more comfortable with mm -hmm. that. Um, so you work with a lot of uh, of uh, couples then who are are getting getting married. And, yeah. Um, what's that What's that relationship like? How does that? I'm finding that I'm I have a lot to do with kind of setting the tone for their day. Mm -hmm. um, I try to take as much worry off of them as possible. And I am becoming their friends in the process. And a couple of weddings I'm going to as a guest after making, so I'm probably going to be pretty tired, but mm. I'm finding that the florals are kind of opening the door to having conversations with people that I would have never instigated or started and um, I found myself kind of counseling uh, 
couple recently and I was like, this is really intriguing. I never <laughs> anticipated this happen. But really just asking, are you guys, are you serious about each other? Do you love each other? Like, let's talk about that. Like, we can call this off right now. It really, like, that's important to me. I want to make flowers for you guys. Do you choose each other? And they were like, oh, yeah. Yeah, we're just so stressed about the details. And I'm just trying to remind them, like, it's just one day. Right. And it's, it's going to be fun. fun. <laughs> like, just it's just chill time. out. Let me do my job. And that's why you hire artists for right. and collaborate with people who are passionate and can see, like, the big picture is we'll step in and do all the magic behind the scenes exactly. because that's what we do. We're comfortable doing that so that you can really enjoy your day. I don't want to talk to my brides on their wedding day unless I'm giving them a hug and giving them their flowers and then I right. go into the background. Things need and to I, be decided by then. Yes. I don't want to ask any questions of them of what to do. Mm. I just want to say you're gorgeous. You deserve just to relax today. Um, and here's your beautiful bouquet and like have fun, you know, just reflect and realize like these are just amplifying the choices that you're making. You're choosing the love somebody. I like that. That's I cool. really like that. So. I also love the idea. You like I've, you do some elopements. Yeah, those are great. Like, I love. I guess when I think of like classic elopement, somehow I don't envision flowers. But mm. I'm learning by by following you that sometimes it's a decision to invest in in this moment mm -hmm. that ends up being almost a like a private moment. Yeah. What's that all about? think I don't know if it's a trend or what but people are really choosing to kind of step away from this grand scale event mm -hmm. and they're choosing to wear their hiking clothes and have their wedding dress in a backpack and like once they get up to the top they get dressed real quick and then they you know find each other and a lot of times I'll create like a huge wild bouquet that matches whatever environment they're in, like waterfall or some mountain top. Um, and I love those because I mm -hmm. know that they're really choosing each other. And it's just exciting to be a part of that. Um, this feels like I get to set intentions for them, like here, enjoy each other. And here's some beauty. And thank you for not making it a big deal. Um, but also, if you want to make it a big deal, that's great too. <laughs> um, but I do love elopement so much. Yeah, it's like, kind of like a um, like a two person flash mob where you just show up yes. somewhere <laughs> <laughs> and have like this performance art moment. Yeah, with flowers. I do, and then run off. And, right. You know, a lot of people will travel here to Oregon, have an elopement take like a week of just like traveling oh, around the coastal yeah. line. This would be the place to do it, right? It's really lovely. And they're just always so sweet and they're choosing each other. And I like to be a part of that process. Yeah. Well, okay, thank you so much for, for being with, with me here today on, on the first reincarnation <laughs> of Arts Alive. Thank yes. you for bringing these beautiful flowers. Um, thank you for tuning in uh, to Arts Alive, and we'll be, be back in a month talking to more artists and creators and makers in Yamhill County to figure out what their work is all about. Thank you. Thank you.